Welcome back to the Contacts Coaching Podcast. We are joined today by Anthony Romero, offensive coordinator at Cabrillo College. Coach, thanks for jumping on the pod today. Appreciate having you here. I appreciate being on here, man. Appreciate the experience. Appreciate the time. Well, let's dive into this thing, Coach. Why don't you take us through your background? How'd you end up in this profession? What was the process like for you landing your first job? And then the steps along the way, since I think we we discussed you're in step three, or at least school three of this coaching journey. But before you get there, like, take me back to high school. How do we end up in, in this business? Yeah, so high school, I played football, Alisa High School. That's where I graduated from. I was very fortunate to have a lot of good men, good mentors, good people around me. Shanil Smith was my head coach at Alisal, and he is my biggest mentor to this day, guides me through this journey. And really, he's been the biggest advocate for me to keep coaching and to do what I do now. Um, so from there, went to Hartnell. He happened to go and leave Alisal to be a, an assistant at Hartnell, so that helped to take the next step and play football hard now. And that's where I met more people. And I guess that's the trend is more great men, great coaches. I met coach Berlanga there, coach Hanson, and a lot of other great coaches that molded me and have mentored me through the process. And then from there, played two years there. Um, wasn't really the guy. I was always just kind of a role player, but I never let that be a reason why I quit or stopped playing or, I just let that be my fuel to my fire to just keep going. Like there's going to be a window opening for me, you know, and then I earned a couple scholarship offers, I ended up going to Bethel college in Kansas and NAI school, but I got my school paid for. So um, let's, I'm a, let's roll. I'm like, I've never been to the middle of nowhere, Kansas. I've never been out of California at that point. So I went to Bethel college in Kansas and the rest was history. It was fun. I was a, I was a two year starter played there for two years um, it was a good experience, met a lot of new people, new friends and and new mentors. Again, same thing, people that I really can lean on and and it catapult me into, you know what, I really want to get into teaching and coaching and be around other young men and do what my coaches did for me. And from there, ended up going to coach at Alvarez High School, um, did that for a year where I met, like I said, more great people, great men that have helped me guide to this journey to this day. There's a lot of coaches from that first stint of coaching that have allowed me to grow and get to this next step, which um, I'm really appreciative of those, specifically Coach Cuevas and Coach Mendes. They really gave me my first opportunity, and Coach Santos really helped me out. Then that catapulted in the heart now where Coach Collins was my former head coach in junior college, but he gave me my first junior college opportunity as a very young age, very fortunate, took a chance on me, and – I went all in. I was just a sponge, wanted to learn, did what I could to help the program, help Coach Collins. And I was there from 18, 19, 20, and 21 and went forward through those years. And it was a lot of growth. And then an opportunity came ahead of me to become an offensive coordinator very, very early at the age of 26 at Fabrio College. Coach Hanson, who I met at Hartnell, was one of my coaches, gave me the opportunity to become a head coach. I'm a head coach, an offensive coordinator, and it was fun. It really, really appreciative, and that's how I got to this journey right now. It's just a lot of hard work, a lot of connecting with people, and a lot of just great people that have helped mold me and get me to this opportunity. I'm very thankful for all those people. Thanks for laying that down for me. So let's go right into this offensive coordinator gig and talk a little bit about structure in football. Um, I'm big on the multidisciplinary aspect of this show. Uh, but for those that aren't football coaches an offensive coordinator is basically the head coach of the offense. Um, and you know, you're not running the full program yet, but part of the reasons I understand people to take different football jobs is to get more responsibility, right? You start off as kind of a position coach and hopefully a coordinator and ultimately work your way up, but talk, a little bit about how that structure works. And then I'd love to know um, with all your training and the great mentorship you had, would you realize right away that you needed to figure out as the offensive coordinator, even though you thought you were ready? Yeah. So I would say as far as an offensive coordinator standpoint, things as far as disciplinary or kind of my side of the ball, I feel like, 
figuring out how to manage your side of the ball to make sure that they're prepared because at the end of the day, it's a whole program, but you're in charge of one side of the ball. And that's not just getting them ready to make plays, it's getting them ready to make sure they're going to class, make sure they're showing up on time, make sure they're doing everything right. And at the end of the day, when they leave your program, they're dealing more so with the coordinator, yeah, with the head coach, but they're dealing with the coordinator day in and day out. And that's me. And that they have a good experience and they come out better men at the end. And that was stuff that I knew I had to do, but I figured out really quick, you don't know how to manage that stuff until you get your feet in the fire. And I learned that real quick. And that pretty much pivoting into the next question, next part of the question where even though I had a lot of people train me and I went through different things and diff as a position coach, learning as a coordinator really, really fast that you have a lot more to handle as far as dealing with different personalities, different personnel, different things that may come across your plate that are not even football related, but you got to be able to handle those things, handle them quick and handle them efficiently and to the best of your ability and knowing how to just care for people at the end of the day too, to understand that you're coaching football, you're coaching people, you're coaching young men, but at the end of the day, they're young men and not just players. And I think that was one of the things that I learned real quick that as much as I love coaching football, um, I found out real quick that it's more about the young men and more about the players than it is the X's and O's and it's the relationship aspect. And I knew that's what I loved about the sport, loved about being coordinator so far is that the kids I'm connecting with, the young men I'm connecting with, I learned that real quick. So. Good. Well, let me follow up on something you just said there, which is we're coaching young people. And I think often as coaches, especially early on, we think that I'm coaching hell tennis. Uh, no, you're coaching people and teaching them to play tennis, right? Or football in your case. And that as soon as you get that perspective, it makes a lot of these things easier because your focus becomes the relationship. So I love that you're already figuring that out. Talk to me a little bit about how at your level, and being an offensive coordinator, I'm sure you came in with some ideas of, okay, this is the scheme I want to do. This is what I'm thinking. But then maybe you do or you don't have the players for that. How have you had to adjust over your two years in that role based on what you thought you were going to do and what you ended up doing? So year one, obviously, like anyone, you're going to go with, you have this big kind of like, man, I want to do everything. But then you learn, you learn real quick that less is more. And how do I make, and that doesn't mean that you just run three plays or you only run four. How do you make your more seem like less is really what it is. You have to figure out that. How do I still teach more and do more, but make it feel like it's less to where the kids are playing fast and they're having fun and they're thinking less. You know, you don't want to go out there and play a sport where you're thinking half the time. You just want to play. So that was my balance. The first year we, I went into with a lot of things that I wanted to do. And I realized real quick, one, less numbers, two, injuries, that, man, I got to tailor this offense really quick, really fast, midway through the year. If not, we're not going to be able to field an offense the way I want. So I had to go adjust on the fly year one and find ways to get really creative and find different formations and different alignments and different ways that we can line up to things that we want to do, but in different ways to fit with the personnel that we had. And that was year one. Year one was very, very different because it was we we're a new upstart program. We were barely coming back after the program was not around for a little bit. We brought it back and the kids were all in on it, though. They knew that we were up for a tough task and they did it. And I think that helped me. That made it a lot easier for me is that we had just a bunch of kids that no matter what the situation was, a coach we will do whatever you ask us to do. And it made it a lot easier for me to call plays and to feel the feel the team and do it in that way going into year two was a lot easier because we had more players so now I can actually go and get into all the personnel changes formations and get different guys on the field different body types different personnel packages and we were able to do that this year because we had all those guys so now I'm able to go and do that and it makes it a lot easier and now we can make those week to week adjustments to where we look like one offense this week, but within our scheme and like I said, simplifying it to where it's simple for us, but it looks different to everyone else. 
those guys are like one week we're this, one week we're 21 personnel, one week we're 20 personnel, one week we're 11, one week we're 10, or in the middle of a game, we can go from different variations personnel-wise. And that's only able to be done, one, by finding, finding a way to make it simple, and two, finding a way to where our guys are bought into their roles and they know that when we call these certain packages, I'm the guy for that. And it makes it easier when you have a good culture and good kids and that are all in on everything we do. So. All right, I'm going to follow up on something you just said because I don't understand what you just said in regards to personnel. You said 21, 20. Art mentioned something about it when he was on the pod. Like, what do all those numbers mean when you're talking about personnel groupings? So 10 personnel is one back, no tight end. 20 personnel is two running backs. So the first number is going to indicate the backfield. And then the second number is going to indicate your tight ends. And then after that, your receivers don't have a number. Whether So you just kind of do the math from there. Like, okay, if they have one running back and one tight end, that means the rest of the receivers in alignment. You figure it out that way. But, yeah, so 10 personnel, one running back, no tight end. 11 personnel is one running back, one tight end. 21 is two running backs, one tight end, and so on and so forth. Some people can run 13 personnel, run three tight ends on the field, like the tight, like the Patriots used to do back in the day with Gronk and all those guys. So you can run it however you want, but that's basically what it is. The first number is running back, second number is tight ends, the number that you have out there. All right, that's super helpful for me and anyone else that uh, didn't know what Coach Berlanga or Coach Romero was talking about. So thanks for sharing that. All right, let's 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 do this. Uh, you were at Alvarez. You were a student athlete at three different places. You went to uh, Hardnell for a little bit as a coach, and now you're at Cabrillo. What's the best thing you do in your program that you will always do, regardless of where you are, what sport you're coaching that you can offer to the audience? Don't change the standard and don't change who you are in the sense of, what you don't be trying to be someone else, be you. And the kids really appreciate that. I've learned that really quick being with the coach that I've been with is as long as you are yourself and you have the standard and obviously not everyone has, everyone does things differently. But if you are, you are your genuine self, yourself, and it's a good self, obviously, you know what you have to fix and adapt, which I've learned really quick that, the person, the coach I am now is different than a year ago, two, three, four, adapting. But just be you. Be you and have a standard and don't let it waver. Because the moment kids see that, well, Coach Romero does this for one player, but then it's different for this kid and it's different. It's different for every kid. Then your standard's lost and you lose the kids. If you keep the kids locked in with you by having the same standard and being you, you're going to have them forever and they're going to run through a wall for you. And that's really, if you keep your players and the culture locked in, everything else is easy. It's easy to coach football in any sport when you have the kids behind you. And I think that's the biggest thing is just making sure that you are genuine, you're yourself and you keep the standard and that's where you have it at, you know, and it helps keep the kids locked in. I'm going to push back on that for a second. Um, in coaching, all these different athletes that you have now been around at all these different spots. What do you mean when you say keep the standard, the standard? Cause I'm very big on fair is not equal. And uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, um, each situation is different. I try to meet kids where they are. Uh, how do you navigate, keep the standard, the standard, but also understand that fair is not equal. Yeah. So what I mean by standards, the standard is that we're not, we don't want, players to ever think that, well, he's giving special treatment to so-and-so. Well, no, that's not the case. We want to make sure, or at least for me, because I've been at programs where there has been special treatment and kids see it and kids don't like it. And it's just obvious where if you treat everyone fair and fair is to everyone's personal standard. So if everyone knows that that's the case, it's going to be good. And you said that from the start. And I think that's what I mean, because that is one of our standards, it's just like you as well, coach, where I've seen it when the way of, well, he does treat player A different than player B, but it's because his standard is this standard versus this standard, you know, for that certain player, because every player is different. Every player's approach is different. So you have to treat every player different, but it doesn't change the standard of what the program is. 
And I think that's where I'm really trying to get at. So, and I think it's been super, super evident that I, with the programs that I've been at that, that they're able to find the lines between the two of the standard is the standard, but like you said, not, it's not always fair. You know, sometimes like you said, player A and player B have the standards of what the program are, but now we're trying to go and like, okay, well, player A has this, player B has this. And I think being under Coach Hanson has shown me that you can go and find it in that way, you know, and find it to where you're not going to be able to treat them both the same, but it's going to be good enough for that player and it's not going to be detrimental to the program. That's how I see it in that way. Yeah, no doubt. All right, let me ask this question. As a younger guy, um, what is your approach to continuing education in regards to what are the resources that you find yourself using most often to grow your coaching game? And obviously there's going to be a lot of football stuff, but I'm also curious what you do to think outside the box and potentially learn from other sport disciplines. But in general, at this point, what have you done? How have you evolved in your way as a coach and how you're trying to continue to, to learn on, on the fly? Yeah. So what I try to do is even if I just try to get with coaches and it doesn't really have to be football specific. I like to learn how other coaches structure their practices, how they structure their programs, how they handle different scenarios as far as discipline or how they're, Hey, if what how do you what's your take on this? If player A is handling having this situation and it might be potentially detrimental to himself or the program, I really more so the X's and O's are great, they're fun, but I want to figure out because to the point that I want to be a head coach at some point, I want to figure out and get in the minds of coaches from any program, whether it's tennis, soccer, and swimming or whatever it may be that how do you handle young men and coaching young men and women? And how do you go and get into that aspect of it? And I feel like I try my best to go and just talk to leaders and coaches, whether it be football coaches, whether it's soccer coaches. Um, sometimes I even connect with coaches that are at the, at the high school level, because really the high school level has the most, creative things of like how to handle things because they have so much things that happen. I get a lot of my best things from lower level coaches because they don't have the resources so they make the most out of what they have. And that's what helps me to be, well, I'm probably going to be more in a situation like that than trying to get it from a division one coach. I'm, I don't have those things. So I feel like I just try to go and make myself a sponge and try to go and get knowledge from all angles and, and try to see what's the best that I can do for myself. I am at no point where I feel like I know it all. And I feel like just putting my surrounding myself with a lot of people that have a lot of knowledge and wisdom and, and experience. I feel like that helps. So tell me then if that's the approach, what are some things you've gotten from speaking to or learning from non football coaches that you have been able to uh, implement or apply or make suggestions to Coach Hanson. Hey, I saw the tennis team doing this. I think it can really help us or whatever that the, the tidbits you've been able to pick up outside of the, the gridiron. Yeah, so the biggest thing is so at my time and figuring out and talking with other coaches specifically at one point just like I said, and he's, he's great because he's coached a bunch of different sports is Chanel Smith. He coaches softball and he does that. And I asked him, what was the transition from going from football to softball? That's a whole different sport, you know, because he knows football. He, he he knows. But now he's coaching softball and he's been doing it for a while. I'm like, what was the transition? And he really told me there really isn't a transition. Yeah, the sport's different. And he gave me so many things of like, it's just about caring for the kids and it's about understanding you're teaching young people, young men, women. And really a lot of those things is really what's helped me to understand that all sports, yeah, they may be different, but now I see how he handles his softball practice. And I go and see him, hey, coach, like a lot of things that we're kind of, it's more reaffirmation, like reassuring what we're doing is on the right path. It may be a little different than what a lot of other coaches do, 
but it's more so just kind of seeing how other coaches do it with their specific sports and really seeing how does it tailor to us. And like I said, I don't have a ton of experience seeing it from a bunch of different sports, but seeing it from that angle, from someone who went from my sport to a different sport and seeing how they approach it, their approach really wasn't different. It's just the sport's different. Now they have to be more of a sponge to learn the sport. And I feel like I want to get myself back to the point where, yeah, I've been around football for a while, but how do I keep myself at the point where I'm still allowing myself to learn and keep growing with that? So, No, for sure. And that's why I'm curious all the time of how are people are learning. So I'll follow up with a different approach then, which is what's the most innovative thing you have done, regardless of where you got it from, that is thinking outside the box to give yourself an advantage over the last two years since you became an offensive coordinator? So I would say for me, going and talking to the opposite side of the ball. I hold on. So, let me let me follow up with. It's not so much about how you got to where you are, but what what have you actually implemented? Like straight up, like this is not something I would have done other places, but because what's the what's the cliche? Uh, necessity is the mother of invention. Like this is what we're doing that is not traditional that you had to come up with on the fly. Okay. Okay. So now I'm understanding the question better. So more so what did I. So here's an example. Restate it for me. Restate it for me one more time. I I will. This is fine. This is is part of the dialogue. Whatever it was 10, 15 years ago when Piedmont high school came up with the a 11 or the craziness that was going on. And then they, they outlawed it out of your approach of trying to get better and trying to give yourself an advantage. What's something you've done as the offensive coordinator over the last two years, that's kind of thinking outside the box that people don't usually do, but you had to do because you didn't think you were going to be able to get through the season that first year, right? That you have held on to because it was so effective that you can offer up to other people that are listening. Yeah. I would say the biggest thing was cross training athletes and understanding that, the limitations of players is not as big as people make it out to be and understanding that people always going like, Oh, well, he's not gonna be able to do it. He's not gonna be able to do it. It, That's too much for him. It's too much on his plate and understanding that, you know what, I got to be able to cross train guys to different various spots of the offense. So then now we're not in a spot where, man, this guy goes down. We don't have anyone else where, Hey, this guy knows tackle. He knows tight end. He knows fullback. He could play every three spots. So if someone goes down, he's plug and play, plug and play where that's where I feel like was one of the things where a lot of, I didn't see that happening a lot at our level. A lot of the times it was more so they're like, well, he just plays that one spot and that's it. He doesn't need to learn anything else. It's going to be too much. He's going to play slow. You got to give these kids more credit, man. They can learn a lot. And I think that was one of the things that I got out of my old school thinking of, they just need to know one thing. No. These guys, if they're up to the task and they can do it and you know your players, they can go and play one, two, three, four spots. And if they can learn multiple spots, they help you to stay versatile multiple and then they become more valuable to the team. So that was one way of thinking that I was able to break the old school mold of how they don't even need to know one position where I was able to cross train guys to learn multiples. It's kind of like basketball too. If a guy can play the one, the two, and the three, you get an injury go down, he – well, let's plug him to the three. It's not a natural spot, but he could play it. And we have another one that can come in. That's kind of how I did it for football, which is not very keen at the junior college level, but we've, I found a way to kind of do it and it's helped us tremendously. Yeah, no, I think it's a great example. And I think smaller schools that have to play more Ironman football are usually in that boat rather than schools that can go one way. And I think ultimately that's a great thing for people to digest um you don't necessarily have to stick to one way or the other and if your athletes are capable then again fair is not equal you can give some people more options to do extra things because it helps them and the program let me ask uh this as you stepped into each of these different roles right where you first cut your teeth whatever position you were coaching there and then at Hartnell and then you got your OC job are there any failures that stand out for you uh, that helped you grow as a coach due to that moment where you, you know, kind of fumbled a situation and had to learn from it. Yeah. I I can name a bunch of failures from all three spots. And I think that'd be valuable to coaches that are 
right now that are current high school coaches that are just starting and they're like, well, this guy failed and he was able to go forward. Right. And I'm not the standard, but I guess it, it, it can help out with a lot of people that may listen. You know, my first year coaching, I, I didn't know I was learning and coaching and I was so worried about, man, are these kids going to like me or respect me? So I went over the top to make sure that these kids liked me, but I'm like, I don't need them to like me. I learned the year later, like they need to respect me and be allow me to coach them. So that was the first mistake I made is I was their friend first. And it was hard to retract that back. But I learned I'm not doing that again. Now the kids respected me because they were good kids, but there were always a sum of a man. If I would have handled that situation differently, you'd probably get a better result or he has a better effort at practice because I allowed him to get away with more because I didn't want to step on his toes as a first year coach. So going into Harnell, I made the jump from high school to junior college. One of my first failures was kind of similar to that, but it was more so handling of, hey, I got to tell a kid that he's not the starter anymore. And I got to go, and I've never had to deal with that before. And these are young men. So I'm like, how do I handle this situation? You know, I've never done this before. I did it what I thought was best that I could, but I didn't hand. Now looking back with experience, I'm like, you know, I could have handled that better. And it was more of a knee jerk reaction. I could have handled it better. And I, the kid to this day, he, we have the best relationship ever, but I always tell him, man, I feel like I failed you sometimes because the way I handled the situation of you not being the starter anymore and the way it kind of went about, I could have handled it better, but that open dialogue later on, the kid understood and we're all like on the best of terms and we still talk to this day, but that was one of the things of really just player relationship and how you handle those tough situations was as a young coach, you don't know until you go through those situations, but I learned it. And I'm forever grateful that at the times those kids always understood and that they knew that it wasn't from a malicious standpoint. It was just me figuring out how to do this thing. And they were there with me every step of the way. Now going to Cabrillo as the offensive coordinator, one failure that could just stand out from there was doing too much, doing too much in the sense that I'm spreading myself so thin that, and not that I never delegated, but I wanted to do everything myself and uh, implement so much that I got to the point where like, man, I need to do less. And by the time I realized that I'm like, man, we're, I need to find a way to, to reel this thing back in. And I found a way I was able to go and pivot, talk to coaches and felt like, Hey, let's make this thing. So let's simplify this thing. Let's brainstorm together. And that was one area of growth that I saw that I had a failure of doing too much, but I was able to, you know what, it's okay to go and delegate. It's okay to go and let your coaches assist and do more. They want to do more. Your assistants want to do more. And I allowed them to do more, especially this year. I let them do more. Well, obviously within what I thought they could do and what I was comfortable letting go. Like Berlanga had, I remember Berlanga talking about this to delegate was one of the hardest things to do. And I did it and it allowed me to grow as a coach to do. I was able to do more because I had less on my plate. My coaches were able to grow and do more. And I learned from that failure of non-delegating and allowing myself to delegate. It was just a better experience for myself, my coaches and everything else. So just those three failures are three things that I really have piggybacked to go and be where I am now and still not anywhere close where I want to be. But well, I appreciate you sharing those. And that's part of the process is kind of falling down in order to get up and, and grow from those situations. Uh, let me ask this question, which is what have you most recently changed your mind on? And it doesn't have to be football related. It's really just about the idea of constantly reassessing your own belief system. And so I always try to throw this out there as a growth mindset question, which is, Hey, I used to be over here and pretty dug in and now I'm over here and here's why. I, I used to always be like, everything's got to be like, and so this was one thing that I was always kind of dug in on, like just as a philosophy thing, I always felt like, Oh man, like, like you can't, and it was finding the balance. I was always, because at one point and we talked about earlier, I was my first year. I was so worried about kids liking me, being friends with them. 
then I went over the top to where I'm like this. Oh, well, then that means I got to be the extra mean guy and no one ever likes me, you know. Finding the balance, I'm like, okay, how do I go and, like, change my ways, you know? Like, what do I do? And I was so set on, like, well, it's got to be one or the other. I can't, like, you can't be both. And I'm like, how do I change? How do I do this, you know? And I found, a like, still finding that middle ground is always going to be tough. But finding a way to where, like I said, just being yourself and just I think that's really kind of all you have to do because I was always hell bent on like man every coach either is really really mean or really really nice and I never figured that out at first I was just like what what do I have to do and I feel like I was hell bent on one or heck bent on one of the other that there's no way you could be in the middle there's no way and I think I'm figuring it out now as I go that you can be Cause just old school thinking, I always had, I always had coaches that were either really, really nice or they're like, man, they're just kicking me in the butt telling me I got to go, 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 go. And I'm like, man, I'm like, so I had never at that point, ever met a middle ground coach yet to that point, or at least never understood it till I got to that position. I'm like, you know what? There are a bunch of coaches like that and they've set the standard and, and I just was too young to realize that. I guess that's probably the best way you can put it. So. No, I like that. I think ultimately you started off the episode talking about how authenticity matters and you got to figure out who you want to be. And when you're trying to wear all these different hats, then the kids see right through it. And ultimately that's the truth of the matter, right? So if you're trying to be friendly or you're trying to be mean or whatever it is, right, you just got to be yourself. And yeah, you can navigate how to be respected and liked at the same time, right? You don't have to have this binary of it's either or i'll always talk about embrace the power of and and uh, how do you go about your life trying to do that in situations that uh, allow you to meet the student athletes where they are and i think that's a great thing to be working on let me uh follow up with this and, and we'll wrap up here if you were starting over today what would you do differently what would you uh what piece of advice would you give yourself so you could uh cut the line a little bit here uh, to the knowledge you have today? I would go and tell myself, don't be in such a rush to get to the end game. Don't be in such a rush to, oh man, I got to be a head coach already. Or I got to be an old coordinator. Trust the process. Because I know early on in my career, at some point I was like, man, like I did one year of coaching. I thought I was ready for the world. I thought I was ready to take on everything. And I would just tell myself, hey, take it day by day, trust yourself and just be a sponge and and just keep learning, growing and knowing that. In due time, everything's going to happen. I would say that would be the best piece of advice I could tell my younger self that there's no rush. There's no it's not a race. And because I remember myself, well, I can clear as day. I thought, man, I'm, I'm going to be the youngest head coach ever. I'm going to be the I'm going to be a head coach at 23 years old. And if I go back and tell myself, hey, slow your roll, enjoy the ride and just get it, it ended up working out that way. But at the time, I didn't see it that way. But put yourself around good people, good men, good mentors and good things are going to happen if you put yourself around good people. And that's I guess that would be the other thing is surround you. Make sure you surround yourself with good people. Make sure you surround yourself with good, good men, good mentors, good everyone. And when you're around good people, good things are going to happen. And that's what I would tell my younger self. Yeah, and I think uh, most of us in the coaching space would tell our athletes the same and our colleagues, right? It's you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. So how are you putting yourself in a position to constantly be challenged and constantly be pushed in a, a way that's generative to helping you grow versus just kind of covering, um, you know, whatever you need to happen to get done that day. So I think that's great advice. Uh, it's a great place to wrap up. I appreciate you jumping on today. And uh, I'm going to run off and uh, cover dorm duty now. <laughs> <laughs> Have fun with that, Coach. And, and uh, thank you. Appreciate the opportunity to be on this. Um, like I said, invaluable experience, invaluable resource. And and it's awesome. I love watching your shows. And, and I'll keep, keep being a fan and keep checking it out. Thank you again.